Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for linking in to participate in today's webinar on Colorado Native Fruits. This webinar is hosted by CSU Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range in Colorado. And today, um, Irene Shonley is presenting. Irene is a Gilpin County uh, Extension Director. And she's active in the CSU Native Plants Program and has a particular interest and expertise in native plants and fruits. So we're happy to have Irene here today. Before I hand things over to Irene, I'd like to just make a few announcements. Um, yeah, Joy, you can bring that poll question up. Um, one of the things I want to get from you is so we can get to know more uh, about who you, what your knowledge is and about native fruits is just to do a quick poll to find out um, your knowledge on native fruits. So you can use your mouse to answer no knowledge, some knowledge, or very knowledgeable. And then we'll also bring this same question up at the end to see how much knowledge you've gained. And while you're answering that poll question, I'd just like to direct your attention to the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, if you're new to webinars, this is the chat box, and this is the place that you can communicate with us and with Irene as she's presenting. So if you have questions or comments during her presentation, you can type them in here and hit your enter key. And Irene will address them either during her presentation or at the end. And hopefully we'll have a few, uh, a few moments at the end for question and answer. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Irene. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. So today we will be talking, um, as Jennifer mentioned, about native fruits for Colorado. And um, I think this is a fun topic, particularly as we head into springtime and, um, and all of the different shrubs and other things start to bloom and we start to think about all the fruits that we might be eating over the course of the summer. So the first question is sort of why let's talk about native fruits because a lot of times when people are talking about fruits they think apples and pears and peaches and all these sort of more glamorous fruits but you know and native fruits mostly get overlooked in Colorado and you won't don't even always find them at the um, at the nursery um, okay I see that there's one person that has a raised hand Cheryl did you have a question If you do have a question, Cheryl, you'll have to type it into the thing. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and clear that. Um, so it's OK, I'm just going to. Um, if you do have a question, Cheryl, go ahead and type it in. But anyway, so native fruits are adapted to Colorado weather. And so this is huge, because we have native fruits that um, you know, we have all these fruits that we have to worry about so much in Colorado that, you know, we have a late frost or, we're, you know, there's just going to be a difficult winter or there's all sorts of reasons that, you know, make fruit growing difficult on the front range. And a lot of us just don't have success with them or we don't want to deal with them. And so our native fruits are adapted to our Colorado weather. And so we don't have to worry so much about our spring frosts and other kinds of things. Another thing that's very important is that, you know, as we're heading into a drier time and there are more and more watering restrictions, native fruits may not require water or they may require less water than your standard fruit, fruit tree fruits. And so um, unless there's an unusual drought, which we could be heading for this summer, I mean, all of Colorado is in some sort of drought or another, um, then, you know, they may not require water whatsoever. Uh, native fruits also usually require fewer soil amendments, and this is a terrific thing for people who are just, you know, can't amend their soils that much. And so if you have a pretty, you know, good Colorado soil, often you don't have to do anything. Um, another thing that's really important is that they provide landscape interest. And so they're not simply um, a tree that's going to look good in, or a bush or something like that. In, in, you, know, you, can't, you don't just put them in an orchard and sort of have them be productive. You can actually integrate them into your landscape and have you know, multiple seasons of interest sometimes. And so the fact that you can integrate native fruits into your landscape instead of you know, isolating them in an 
orchard, or sometimes I've heard of them as orchard ghettos, um, then you know that's also interesting. And then also they provide food for wildlife if you aren't um, you know that interested in harvesting them. And that's also important here in Colorado, just because um, you know our wildlife are struggling, and um, you know sometimes the native plants can really replace um, some of the um, fruits that maybe they won't get in the wild. Now this can also be an issue in a couple of different respects. One can be if you don't want that wildlife coming in. I mean, nobody really wants a bear in their backyard, and sometimes you don't really want the you know deer or other kinds of things in there, but you may really be interested in having songbirds come to your garden. So I recognize that that is kind of a mixed bag, whether you have wildlife coming into your garden or not. Um, but because the wildlife do come into the garden, you may want, if you are, if your goal with growing native fruits is to eat some of your harvest, you do want to protect your fruit from critters. Um, you know, the, the native fruits um, are well adapted to using wildlife to distribute them. So the wildlife will, you know, they've, they've developed tasty, enticing fruits in order to get wildlife to eat it and then carry the seeds someplace else and grow new seeds. And so they're actually, you know, the, there's a whole um, relationship between the wildlife and, um, and the native plants. And so um, because wildlife recognize it so easy, it provides um, competition for you as the human being who's trying to raise it for your own um, consumption. So you might want to consider doing things like putting netting on shrubs or on your strawberries or some, you know, providing some mesh cages. Um, you know, this is an example of just a um, you know, simple hoop structure with a mesh uh, a netting, you know, like a bird netting above it. And here's a fairly elaborate thing with a um, cage that has bird netting and keeps the deer and the other things out. So just be aware that you could have a wildlife issue um, when you are using native plants. And that would, of course, depend on you know, how urban you are. Some of the people who are living more um, near open space will probably experience more wildlife issues, and people who are living further away from the open space, like in urban Denver or something like that, may have fewer wildlife issues. OK, the next thing I want to talk about before we get into all the different species is the straight species versus the cultivars. And so what a cultivar is, is a um, it's a plant that was either found in the wild, so you know somebody who was walking along and like, wow, look at that plant. It's got some, you know, special, um, you know, it's got some specially heavy fruit set, or you know, people are walking along eating the fruit and they're like, wow, that is a really tasty version of that particular um, fruit, or maybe it has a, you know, strange uh, leaf color, or something like that. So it can either be a plant that was found in the wild, or was deliberately created through some sort of breeding program, and so and it has so a cultivar has this very distinct trait that is desirable and it is propagated usually um, in some way to, to maintain those desirable characteristics. And so that's often using, you know, cloning or vegetative propagation. And so, um, and so just be aware that there could be the straight species, which has a whole bunch of genetic variability, and it can be, you know, you can get it from all parts of different parts of the state, or sometimes if the distribution is really big, you can get it from lots of different parts of the country, from Canada down to New Mexico. And just be aware that there are these, you know, there's a lot of genetic variability in the sort of straight species, whereas cultivars have very little ge genetic variability due to the fact that they're specially um, propagated. About 71% of them are clonally propagated. And when you have um, a, a cultivar, they, there's a, a name that's given to it. So, for example, if um, you're talking about a um, golden current, Ribes arium, if you are talking about a um, cultivar, they, it was this particular cultivar that I'm talking about is Gwen's buff, buffalo berry. And so you, you put the um, cultivar names in quotes. So it's Ribes arium, Gwen's buffalo berry. So that's just um, the way a cultivar is denoted in the um, taxonomic literature. So you could argue that you know using a cultivar um, could be you know sort of near native. So sometimes you know that's a, a it's really good to use a cultivar if you're um, dealing with a fruit that has a really broad range of flavors. So for example, some of these fruits have pretty you know extreme ranges of flavors, and some of them are really bland, and some of them are really tasty. And if you wanted to be eating a fruit that you knew was good, and you want to plant a bush in your house that you know you knew that the fruit would be really good, you might want to consider getting a, um, a specific named cultivar for it. And for the most part, these still act as native plants in terms of their ecosystem services, but they're not. Um, 
Yeah, but they may actually be, you know, so, I mean, so you could argue that they're near native, but they're, they don't always fulfill that function if, like, sometimes the, um, the, cultiv the cultivar is, um, you know, picked for an especially showy or double or sterile flower, and it doesn't actually produce the fruit, or it doesn't, you know, it somehow it changes the whole pollination syndrome. So just be aware that, um, you know, for the most part, you could consider all these cultivars to be near native, but sometimes they don't. Another thing to consider with um, the different named cultivars is that some of them may be from different areas of the cultivar of the country, and so they may not be adapted to our same conditions as you if as if you were to get a um, straight species that had been you know locally um, produced. So just be aware of these things. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So there's. Um, I guess some issues with uh, somebody who is not hearing, but I think everything else is good on my end of things. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so um, another thing I want to point out, especially if you are using the cultivars, is that it's best to often to have two different cultivars, and so um, or a cultivar and a straight species, because the genetic again remember that the cultivars tend to be about 71% clonally propagated, and so they don't always have enough genetic variation to produce uh, maximum production. And so it's good to have a cultivar and a straight species or two different cultivars if you are um, trying to get maximum production from your fruit. Okay, let's move on. All right, so now we're talking about our first fruit. And this first one is serviceberry, Amelanchier alnifolia. And I love this plant. It is a terrific landscaping plant. It has beautiful white flowers in the springtime. Um, they're lightly fragrant. And then they produce um, a lovely blue-colored berry um, in the middle of the summer. And the berries are um, tasty for humans, and they're tasty for wildlife. So they're also a good bird-attracting tree. And then, um, and then in the fall, they produce a beautiful red color. And so they're really um, good for all that three season of interest. So this is a great landscaping plant, and it's a good fruit-producing plant. Um, the service berries, or Amelanchier alnifolia, are hardy up to 10,000 feet. So all of you who are from higher elevations, this is great news. Um, mostly you'll find the Amelanchier alnifolia above 6,000 feet, and typically it has a more western slope distribution, but you will find it at higher elevations above 6,000 feet in, in certain cases on the, on, um, the eastern slope. Um, if you are planting it in your garden, it will produce best with full sun and moist, acidic to neutral soils amended with organic matter. And again, as you go up in elevation, typically the soils will get to be a little bit more acidic or you know neutral in Colorado. And certainly, if you have a neutral soil um, at your you know neutral to not too alkaline soil, um, you'll be doing just fine. Um, if you mulch them, they will certainly produce better with less water. And again, the way we're looking into the summer, um, it's looking like at least they're going to be deciding how many, much watering restrictions are even going to be in a lot of the urban um, cities. And so that could be a real issue with you know um, even establishing a plant or if you have one in, in how much water it's going to need. Obviously, as you go up in elevation, um, with the cooler nights and the increased precipitation, they need less water, and so they're generally speaking more drought tolerant, or they, you know, um, or you could just say that they need need less water at higher elevations. So the um, again, the Amelanchier alnifolia is a tremendously variable. Um, plant and it grows you know so you can find it from six feet tall to 15 feet tall it does bear fairly early so two to four years old and you should be aware that it's the host of the apple cedar rust so there there can be some issues with that it's the alternate host of that so it can be a problem um, with you know some junipers and other kinds of things in the area um, the fruit in Amelanchier alnifolia is produced at, on the previous year's growth so uh, or even older wood, and so um, so usually you want to not prune it so that you prune off all of um, the older wood. But in general, the younger, vigorous branches yield the highest quality fruit. So you do, you know, if you're trying to go for maximum um, flavor and maximum production, you do want to, you know, do some pruning maintenance to keep, you know, 
um, younger branches in the mix. And here's something that's pretty um, uh, challenging is that the fruit really widely varies in taste. And so it can be from quite bland. If you're just, you know, if you're walking in the woods and you find one and you eat one, you might find that it's just quite bland. You think, what's the fuss about this? And, um, and so, uh, and then you might be walking in the woods and you find one and you're like, wow, this is some of the really great things. Um, you know, this is a terrific, um, this is a terrific plant and I'd really love to eat it. And so this is one of those things where you might want to consider getting a cultivar, although you certainly don't have to. I mean, but just be aware that it could be um, an issue. So some of the cultivars, um, and most of the ones that you'll find the best cultivars come from Canada. Um, because in Canada, just because they have a more limited fruit production, they actually go for more of the production of some of what uh, some of these smaller fruits that are often native fruits. And so these do are native all the way up into Canada. And so some of the ones and some of the named cultivars that have been bred specifically for um, for the flavor of their fruit and for the yields are Northline which is, grows to be about five to seven foot tall and becomes a fruiting hedge. So it does sucker profusely, so you do want to be aware of that. And But it really does have very good yields, and it's a very early bearer with fr flavor flavorful fruit. Uh, smoky is also another good one with exceptionally fr sweet fruit. It gets a little bit taller, eight to ten feet tall, and also has very good yields. So those are some ones to look for, but if you can simply just find the um, straight species, that would also be good. Okay, I'm going to go to the questions now. Carolyn asks, how is the rust a problem with junipers? Should you keep service berries away from my apple trees? No, so you don't need to worry about service berries and the apple trees. And it just, I mean, it's basically the, the apple, um, the cedar apple rust is, is, you know, it's a natural thing that happens up in, you know, it mostly, you know, goes on in the native areas. And it's not usually something that you have to worry about too terribly much in the landscape, but, um, you know, Potentially, you could get, um, you know, some sort of rust going on, but certainly you don't have to worry about the um, the apple um, cedar rust being an issue with your apple trees. Okay, some other um, cultivars that are good um, include Regent, which is a compact, um, another compact one. So if you're looking for it to fit into your landscaping, um, that five to six feet tall, again, f um, chosen for a good flavorful fruit, and Success, which was also selected for very heavy fruit. So there's a lot of different options out there, but again, if all you can find is the straight species, I think that that would be a terrific one to plant as well. There's also, um, for those of you who live in the hotter, drier areas, because I know I'm speaking to people all across the state, there's another um, service berry, Amelanchier utahensis, the Utah service berry. And that one is more adapted to even hot, dry areas than the Amelanchier alnifolia. And so it's a fairly slow-growing tree. It can get fairly tall. Um, and it you know, starts at lower elevations, so 5,000 and 9,000 feet. It's mostly, as you might guess from the name, found in Utah, but also the very western reaches of Colorado. And it has a higher drought resistance also than the, our, um, our Amelanchier, or you know, the one that's more native on this side. Um, and it can um, take you know, different kinds of soil. Now, the one thing I wasn't able to find, and I personally have never eaten um, a Utah service bear. I've never been over on the western slope at the right time. So I don't actually know how these taste. Um, but you know, th they are said to be edible fruits. And you know, some people are said to make things out of it. Has anybody ever eaten um, anything, any of the Utah service berries, service berries, if you have, I'd be interested in hearing you go ahead and type that in. Um, they still make a great landscaping plant, and they would still provide a lot of, um, you know, berries for birds and probably would make good jams, but I just don't know that they would be um, as exciting uh, and edible as the um, Amelanchier alnifolia, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. Next one is another one of my favorites, the Golden Current, Ribes arium. Um, this is a shrub that, again, has three seasons of interest, which is terrific. It's always good to get lots of seasons out of your, of your plants. It has um, yellow flowers in the springtime. Later on in the summer, it produces berries, or currants, essentially. Um, and they can vary in color from sort of a golden color to a reddish color to a blackish color. And you know, these ones are ripening into a black. But on the different fruits, that's a little bit you know, variable what the color of the actual currants are. Um, and then in the fall, they turn a really nice red color. So again, really 
great, great three seasons of interest um, on one small shrub. I do want to say that there's some taxonomic confusion with Ribes odoratum, and so um, and it's not quite clear. So a lot of the plants that are considered to be Ribes aureum, the golden currant, are listed as having a very fine um, clove fragrance in the springtime, and then other um, books and things say that it's only Ribes odoratum that has that fine clove smell. And so I have smelled both um, Ribes aureums that have no fragrance whatsoever, and I have smelled ri things that are labeled as Ribes aureum that have a wonderful wafting clove odor in the springtime. I mean, it's such a good smelling um, plant that you would want to plant it someplace where you can really smell that. It smells gorgeous in the springtime, and it's covered with these, you know, yellow flowers. And so I'm thinking to myself, why would anyone want to plant a forsythia when, um, you know, this golden currant not only has these yellow flowers, but it has a beautiful fragrance, and then it has two more seasons of interest. So for me, it's a no-brainer which one you'd pick. But anyway, so despite the um, taxonomic confusion, you know, they're quite similar except for this difference possibly in the smell. I mean, so it's not quite clear whether um, the all of the, um, if there's just some genetic variation within the golden current with the smell gene or not, and, you know, or whether they, everything that smells should be listed as Ribes odoratum. So I'm sure that's going to get worked out by somebody who wants a good research project someday. Anyway, so the um, Ribes Arium grow to be about three to five feet tall, and they will grow in poor dry soils. So again, this is a real boon to the gardener who just can't, um, you know, fully amend their soils. But of course, they're going to pr produce best in amended soils with some water, especially if we're having that really dry year. So if your goal is really to produce a lot of fruit, you do want to um, give it as much chance as possible. They will grow and produce in full sun to part shade. And the, the fruit flavor is tart to sweet. And again, there's some genetic variation on that. But it usually has a really nice full flavor. And people often will use it for jams and jellies and syrups and other things like that. And again, just like the um, service berry, um, this can be the alternate host of the white pine, pine blister rust. And so that is something, you know, a, a non native rust that is going around, but it's usually not an issue for people who are living in the in um, areas outside of, um, you know, w where that may be an issue. So some of the cultivars, and, you know, you certainly don't need to pick a cultivar unless um, you're dead set on having that fragrance, and I would highly recommend that fragrance. Um, it does happen early in the spring. Um, and then you probably at least want to buy a plant that's in bloom in the nursery so you can smell it or um, get a named cultivar where you know that it may have a really good um, fragrance. And so one of the ones that has it all is the Gwen's Buffalo Current. So that's Ribes aureum Gwen's buff Buffalo. And again, it will grow three to five feet tall, so that wasn't really changed. But basically, it was selected for its improved fruiting habit. So for those of you who are really looking for um, that kind of... Um, if that's your goal in the landscape, then this is a really good choice. And again, it has the really good fragrant yellow blooms and a solid orange to red fall color. Another one, um, and this is a cultivar of Ribes odoratum, but it sometimes gets, you know, there's there's just um, a lot of confusion about this, but the Crandall clove currant. So this is Ribes odoratum Crandall. And this is a little bit taller plant. It's four to six feet tall. Um, but again, it has a beautiful clove fragrance in the springtime. And the fruits are maybe a little bit sweeter and spicier. Um, and again, beautiful color in the fall. OK, creeping Mahonia, Mahonia repens. Now, this may not be one that you'd immediately come to mind if you were thinking about different Colorado fruits. Um, but this is a native fruit-bearing um, plant in the um, Berberidaceae. And again, it's a really terrific landscaping plant that also provides some fruit. So in the springtime, it has these great yellow flowers that really smell nice. I mean, the, even though it's a very low to the garden ground plant, it's absolutely worth getting on your knees and smelling them um, because they have this you know great honey odor to them. Um, they will stay evergreen all winter long, and the fact they'll even take on a reddish hue in the winter, in some cases they'll turn completely red in the winter time, um, and then they'll produce the blue flare, blue berries later on in the summer, so in sort of the late summer to early fall. And mostly wildlife like these berries, you know, they can be a little bit on the not so, um, 
they wouldn't be one of the first things that would come to mind in, in terms of delicious fruit. They are a little bit on the bland side, but they do provide some, you know, you could actually use them for fruit, or again, the wildlife are happy to eat this. Now, one of the main landscaping um, features that um, I think is terrific about the creeping mahonia is that it is a suitable plant for dry shade. And that is a pretty tough niche to fill in Colorado landscapes. And so whether um, you can, you know, this is, you know, something that you can think about as, you know, primarily solving a landscaping problem, but then you get the rewards of those great, the great flowers in the springtime, and then you can use the berries later on. Um, so with growing the, um, the Mahonia Reapin, so again, it can grow in that dry shade of conifers, which is pretty tough um, niche otherwise. It doesn't need any soil amendments whatsoever, and it is adapt adapted to dry soils, whether it's in the you know, sun or the shade. I will tell you, though, it's a bit difficult to get established, and so some of the tips you can ha try for getting them established are to plant some larger plants and then to protect them from wind the first winter. So that can be, you know, mulching them. It can be putting up a, you know, cage and filling them with leaves or wrapping them or putting a, you know, a floating row cover on for the first winter. Something just to get them through that first winter. And if they get through that first winter, they're going to be pretty successful at your place. And again, that fruit's not a fabulously delicious um, fruit but it can make some pretty decent preserves. And I know that at least the you know, early settlers um, thought it was quite the prize as preserves. OK, I'm going to go to the questions. Um, Bernice Dyer says, my current never produces fruit. Um, yeah, it's so there could be a couple of different things going on. You could have it in too much shade. Um, possibly you're not giving it much in the way of water. Um, Possibly, you know, you do need to get some more cross-pollination, and so, you know, I don't know if you've got a current, you know, I don't know if you have a named cultivar or, um, or a straight species, but, you know, that's something that you do want to consider. So, I guess there could be a couple different things going on. I couldn't tell for sure what it is, but, you know, I would, I would look at the soil, the water, or possibly getting um, another current. Um, also, the sun. So, if it's in too deep of shade, it's not going to um, produce good fruit. And I'll just wait for this next comment um, to come in before I move on to the next plant. So there's another question being typed in right now. Um, so the next question is, are currants have white flowers? Which species? Um, there are, that could be a couple different ones, so I couldn't tell for sure. Um, and some of the, like the wax currants can have white or pink flowers that are almost white, and there's some of the other ones. So I'm not positive which um, species you'd have. We'd actually have to, you know, look at it and key it out. Um, okay, we've got one more question coming in. Um, and then, okay, so the question from Sydney Carnahan is, is a second plant enough for cross-pollination? Yes, and just one other plant, um, you know, relatively, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly next door, but, you know, in the same general vicinity, a second plant is enough for cross-pollination. Now, you wouldn't want to have two plants of Gwen's buffalo berry um, because that wouldn't give you that cross-pollination, but if you had Gwen's buffalo berry in a straight species or Gwen's buffalo berry and the um, Crandall clove currant or something like that, okay? All right, moving on. Next one, American Plum. Another one of my absolute favorites. So this is Prunus Americana. It's going to be blooming in about another month here, and I cannot wait until it starts to bloom. It's one of my favorite plants to go and take hikes and, and just smell the flowers. I mean, it's such a welcome flower um, after uh, the springtime, and it's one of those early blooming ones, and it just smells so good. And so if you have never gone out and smelled a uh, an American plum when it's in bloom, you owe yourself that treat, and you can easily go um, into the... Um, anywhere in the foothills and find it blooming, um, you know, probably uh, late April. Um, but that's not the place, you know, it doesn't end there. It also produces very nice plums later on in the season. And the plums are not the kind of plums, they're very small, and they're not the kind of plums that you're just going to pick and you're going to eat. You're going to, um, you're actually going to uh, make these into some sort of preserves or jam or a plum tart, and that's one of the most flavorful, delicious things you'll ever um, be eating, um, I think. I just, I, this is one of my favorites for so many different reasons. 
um, it only is hardy to about 8,000 feet. And even that 8,000 feet is really pushing it. If you're going to go above um, like about 7,000 feet, you're really going to need a very hot south-facing exposure. Um, I unfortunately cannot grow it up here in, in Rollinsville, and I'm very sorry about that because um, if I could be growing it, I'd be growing it like crazy. Uh, another great thing about the native plums is that it grows well on poor soils. It tolerates drought and, of course, just like any other fruit, it will produce best with amendments and water. And so in a drought year, you're not going to find a heck of a lot of production on um, any of these native fruits. And so if we have another really dry year, what you'll see is that the plants themselves will survive. They may kind of you know, look a little gnarly. They may have a little dieback and some other kinds of things if we have a really dry summer and you don't water, but they'll still live, unlike some of these are cultivated fruits which may not make it through a really dry time without that water. So that's one of, again one of the differences between the native fruits and the cultivated fruits. Um, American plums need full sun and so this is um, absolutely critical. Um, it, it will not produce well in any sort of shade whatsoever and if you look into the foothills you won't ever see it growing in a shady area. It will um, form thickets because it does sucker quite a lot and there can be some thorn-like areas. So you do need to sort of, you know, know what you're getting into if you do want to grow this. So you kind of have to give it a space where it's got some room in your garden. Um, and so if you have a very small plot, this may be not for you. Um, it is also susceptible to black knot disease and those tend to, that tends to happen more in the um, early part of the season, if it's especially if it is a wet year. And we do have a fact sheet on um, extension about dealing with the black knot disease and again the fruits are very tart so you're not going to be eating them just picking them from the bush you are going to need some sort of sweetener unless you are just a crazy sour lover person but um, they are so good in preserves and tarts okay so um, let's see we've got some questions before we do that so I had a bug that took over plum trees I had to take them all out to get rid of the insect which began, began my CMG journey huh I don't know what bug that might be, but that's that's interesting. Um, and then the next question from Carol is, what is your preferred soil amendment? And yes, it is compost. So I do highly recommend um, using some sort of compost versus um, most other things. But mostly that's what our, um, our soils in Colorado do need. Okay, so choke cherries. Again, here's a terrific um, tree. It's um, prunus. Um, sometimes it's um, known as pattis if you're using the Weber and Whitman text, but the um, you know more conserved names. And if you're looking for this in a nursery, you'd look at under prunus virginiana. Again, it's a fantastic tree. It has um, you know large racemes of um, sweet smelling flowers in the springtime. They're, they dangle down, they smell very sweet. It produces black fruit late in the summer into the fall and then it turns a beautiful fall red. So this is um, another really great plant to, um, to have. It will be again hardy to about 9,000 feet and it's uh, fairly genetically variable so it goes anywhere from about 6 feet to 15 feet. And again, if you're going for production, it'll produce best with some extra moisture. And that's because you often do find it in riparian areas, but certainly you don't only find it in riparian areas. The time when moisture is the most critical is during that spring vegetative growth and then also during fall fruit bud set. So those are the times if you had to pick two times to not skimp on water, those would be the, the two major times. It will grow in poor soils, um, but again, it will produce better with some sort of amendment, but you still want to have that well-drained soil. And it will produce best in full sun, but it will tolerate some shade, again, because it is typically found in riparian areas. Some of the problems that it has, um, it can be affected by tent caterpillars. I think a lot of people have seen um, the tent caterpillars festooning the branches of them in the springtime. It can also be susceptible to black knot disease and powdery mildew. And just be aware that it does have a very strong suckering habit, so it either forms a hedge. Some people like to sort of clip them up and um, you know, try to make them into a small tree, which you certainly can do, but basically just know that there's going to be suckers trying to come up for most of um, the rest of you know, the existence of the tree. I mean, there is a um, you know, product that they called Sucker Stop, but I've never actually, you know, that's something I haven't personally tested and I haven't heard a lot of people testing it and knowing it, but that is something that you could consider doing. 
Okay, so the question here is, are tent caterpillars harmful to the plant? So for the most part, tent the plant can withstand the tent caterpillars, but if, um, you know, if they defoliate the entire plant year after year, it can be a really problem. And so that's something, to, um, it's something definitely to be aware of. Um, and so you can, you know, clip back the tent caterpillars if you, if it's on your property and you're trying to, you know, keep them, um, you know, producing well, you can certainly clip back the tent caterpillars. Um, but for the most part, you know, they don't come to the same tree year after year and there's not usually so many tent caterpillars that it causes a real harm to the tree. And then um, Megan does point out, thank you Megan, that the choke cherry pits are carcinogenic. Well, they're actually, they're not, the choke cherry pits are toxic to livestock. They're not carcinogenic to livestock. It's actually the choke cherry pits and leaves and the um, fresh fresh branches and what it is is they have cyanide in them so they're actually toxic to livestock and so they can and actually can cause acute poisoning and they can actually die from it so it's really good to point out that there are issues with livestock so you wouldn't ever want to have a choke cherry growing within um, uh, some area that if you had livestock in a corral, you wouldn't want to have the choke cherry in that corral or anywhere where they could lean their heads over the corral and be biting it. Um, okay, so then the next question from Judy Crumma is what follows the caterpillar cycle moths? Yeah, it's a, it's a moth that emerges from the caterpillars. So, and birds, you know, will often come in and, you know, peck into that tent and get rid of the, you know, tent caterpillar problem, but it is a moth. It's not a, it's not one of our beautiful butterflies that often we'll be trying to, to um, raise with our plants. Okay, now I see one more question is coming in and I'll take that question before I move on. Actually, I'll move on to the cultivar. Um, okay, so the, okay, the question here is, is it deer resistant? And deer resistance is really one of those things that um, is, uh, it varies so much and so widely over um, different areas that you can't say for sure that it is deer resistant. The fact that it does produce that cyanide um, does make it more deer resistant, but it certainly, I would not call it um, deer proof in any way, shape, or form. I do want to point out, um, so a little bit on the fruit production of this, um, this is a plant, it does produce about after three to five years, and again, the fruit is very tart, so it's not called choke cherry for nothing, and it's very astringent when it's underripe, and so it can, you know, you, it's not something that you'd want to eat when it's underripe, and in fact, if you're eating it directly from the fruit, or from the shrub, you might want to be eating it after frost, because that's when they become a little bit sweeter. Um, but if you don't want to wait until after frost because you don't want to, you know, let the birds beat you to it, you can pick them and add sugar and it makes an excellent jam or pie or syrup or even some people make wine from it. And again, the wood, leaves, and the pits are poisonous. And there is only really one cultivar that you can get, and that's Schubert's Red. And so it doesn't really affect the flowering or the fruiting, but in the Schubert's Red, the leaves will emerge green and then per turn purple purple red when they're mature and so some people really like that color contrast in their um, landscape and so that you'll see probably more um, more Schubert's reds used in landscape situations than you will um, just the regular straight species and so there's nothing wrong with um, using the Schubert's red it still would provide all of the um, ecosystem services and you know perhaps a little extra color into your landscape. All right, the next one I want to talk about is Woods Rose, Rosa woodsii. Um, this is a uh, shrub that grows from, you know, lower down to um, higher elevations. It has fantastic pink flowers in the springtime. They're very nice and fragrant. Um, on good years, it turns into a nice um, red fall color. And then the hips uh, that are produced provide a really nice winter interest. And the birds will eat these hips, but usually not right away in the wintertime. And so it's kind of one of those foods that they reserve until the spring when there's not that much out there for them to eat and they need to be setting up nests and other kinds of things. And so I like the fact that you can have the beautiful hips all winter long, and yet um, the birds will eat them when they really need to in the springtime. 
So the woods rose will grow in very poor dry soils, but I do want you to be aware that it can have like very suckery rampant growth if you give it a lot of extra moisture or organic matter in the soil. So this can be a plant that can really take over and you can actually tell that your soils are pretty good and that you have good moisture if this is a plant that um, is taking over quite a, quite a large territory. If it stays put, then you know that you're probably more dealing with the um, poor dry soils. And the hips are produced after the flowers. And again, they're not something that you're probably going to eat directly, but it's really good for teas and jams, and it is very high in vitamin C. Okay, our next plant is silver buffalo berry, Schaeferdia argentia. Um, this is a great plant to uh, replace your um, Russian olive if you're still harboring one of those on your property. The Russian olive is a noxious weed in the state of Colorado. And this is a native plant that um, provides a lot of good, um, you know, it provides some similarities in terms of look. They both have the beautiful silvery gray green leaves. Um, but the nice thing about the Schaeferdia argentia, besides being native, is that um, the females of the plant produce beautiful berries um, in the fall. So this is a plant that's dioecious, which means that the males and the females are on separate um, uh, plants. And so you do want to make sure that you have both a male and a female plant in order to get fruit production. And it's one of those things that you can't actually tell in advance. You can't tell if they're male or female at a nursery. Um, so you should you know, probably buy several of these in order to get both the male and the female plants. So the, um, the buffalo berry, the silver buffalo berry is hardy to zone 3. Um, it grows about 6 to 15 feet tall. And again, the males and females are on separate plants. Um, it does fix nitrogen into the soil. And in general, it will be a uh, you know, bigger, lusher plant and produce more fruit if there's some moisture. So again, you'll typically find it in riparian zones, but it's quite drought tolerant. It just may not produce quite as much um, as it would if it were planted in a wetter area. Okay, um, so I'll go back to the questions. Um, so the question from Donna is that I have woods rose in a garden where they're too prolific and I want to remove them. Can they be transplanted and when? Yes, the woods rose actually transplants pretty well um, and they should be transplanted when they're dormant. That will be the easiest time to do it. So as soon as the soil can be dug but there's no leaves out, that would be the ideal time to transplant them. And so you must have good, good um, amended soils and um, some good moisture because they are getting to be pretty prolific. All right. Okay, now we have another comment from Cheryl. Wood roses everywhere on the north side of my house and just keeps growing and appears to hop from one place to another. Um, so it's invasive, but a good fence climber. Okay, so you're finding that it does grow up your fence. Yeah, I mean, so again, it can be, if you have a you know pretty seriously... Um, if you have good amended soils with some extra water, it will it will take up some space. I do not deny that. So um, so you have to abuse it a little bit if you want it to um, stay put. Okay, so um, moving on with the um, silver buffalo berry, the um, fruit of the silver buffalo berry is pretty tart. And again, it's one of those things that ripen and taste a little bit better after the first frosts, but the birds may beat you to it. So if your goal is to eat it, this is something that you just want to you know, be aware of. And you, know, um, and you probably want to cook the fruit and sweeten it. So the raw fruit does contain some saponins, and so that can provide a bitter taste to it. So if you cooked it into, again, a jam or a preserve or something like that, um, then you can solve both of these problems at once. Wild strawberries, Fragaria vesca. These make a terrific ground cover, so they do, um, you know, run along the ground. They'll be a really good plant to use in a sort of moister, um, shady spot. Uh, they will flower in the springtime, and then they do have very tasty, very small little strawberries um, that are produced early in the summertime. Um, and it's a very hardy plant. So you, the, if you got a straight species, that's hardy to zone one. So there is nobody in this call that could not grow this plant. 
Um, it does prefer that extra organic matter in the soil, and it will um, prefer a half-day sun to a full-day sun. So if you're never getting any fruits, it may be that um, that you're just not getting enough sun. So try putting them someplace where there's more sun. The other thing to look for is that you know chipmunks and birds and other things really like the um, fruits, and it's easier for them because they're shorter and, sh and small and you know closer to the ground. They can find the fruits before you are. So if you're not a pretty dedicated fruit checker, it may also be that you're having critter theft, theft, and then you may want to might want to consider putting some sort of cover on top of them to keep the critters out. Um, in for best fruit production, you will water when the soils are dry, um, and you can use some mulch with straw to conserve water. There are some cultivars, um, the alpine strawberries, but again, there's some taxonomic confusion here about whether they really truly are from the Fragaria vesca or if if they are from uh, Fragaria alpina. So it's not, you know, again, that's not been entirely worked out. But the alpine strawberries, you know, are a good choice. Um, there's quite some cultivars, and they're selected for the improved taste or yield. But for those of you who are, live higher elevations, the alpine strawberries, despite the name, actually are only um, hardy to zone 5. So some of the ones you could look for would be Rugen or Mignonette. So it's mostly the Europeans that have really cultivated these um, alpine strawberries. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is wild raspberry, Rubus idaeus, subspecies Melanolasius. Um, and this this is um, so this is the wild raspberry that you'd find if you're out hiking up into the woods. Uh, it's a great hiking snack if you go in the late summertime. Um, and you're going to a place where there's not a lot of people who hike by that because you know everyone, most people can recognize a raspberry and know how delicious they are. So it's something that um, you know you have to hike in a secret spot in order to get um, good raspberries. Okay, so um, so the raspberries. Uh, You'll mostly find them in areas where there's groundwater or a riparian area or something where there's some sort of source of, source of moisture, but not always. You'll, you'll still find them in dry areas, but they're not going to be producing as well as they would in a wet area. So the, um, the raspberries will produce wet best if you have slightly acidic soils, but again, that's not always possible in Colorado. Um, so just you know, amend them as well as you possibly can. Um, and then give them even moisture while flowering and fruiting, because that will um, definitely yield you far more raspberries. And they'll do best if you fertilize them with some sort of a balanced fertilizer in the early spring. They'll produce best if you give them full sun, but you'll often find them in shady areas, but again, they're not going to be um, as productive. And I think I don't need to really talk about the flavor of the fruits. The wild species has a delicious fruit, but there's also some, a lot of good cultivars. And something that you may not be aware of is that the leaves make a good tea. So there's many, many cultivars of the wild raspberry. And in fact, you can almost never buy the um, wild, straight species wild raspberry. And so usually you're going to have to content yourself with a cultivar unless you have somebody you know, who lives in the mountain who has some wild raspberries growing on their land and you know, lets you dig some up. Um, otherwise, probably you're going to be dealing with the cultivars. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with the cultivars. They're really selected for great yield and great flavor. Um, and there's a whole fact sheet on it and extension, so it's right here. The um, it's fact sheet 7001. And um, in general, if you're on the front range, you want to be going for the fall-bearing raspberries. This is according to research from Joel Reich and Boulder County. Um, and then if you live higher elevations, you want to go for a summer-bearing um, plant. And if you're living higher in the mountains, get one that's hardy, so some of the ones that are hardy to zone 3. So there's certainly usually a cultivar that's good for um, any of the uh, mountain residents as well. So I do want to point out that there's some plants. So that's pretty much the plants I want to talk about. But um, the plants that um, you may not want to eat, um, the mountain elderberry, Sambucus microboitris, is considered to be poisonous by many different sources. And so you do want to be aware if you're out hiking up in the woods and you see this you know, beautiful plant. And I highly recommend it as a mountain landscaping plant. Um, and it produces great flowers. And the birds really like them. But you don't want to be eating those and, and making, you know, like a lot of people do, um, eat, cultivate elderberries and eat the fruits and use the you know, flowers for tea. But that is considered to be poisonous. 
Okay, um, I do also want to point out that there is a cookbook, the Fruits of Your Labor cookbook from the Colorado State Forest Service, and that has a lot of the species that I've just been talking about, um, and it does give different recipes for jams, because I did say, you know, there's a lot of good jams and other kinds of things, and so you can use this as a recipe book for some of the different um, fruits that I was talking about. And then also know that there's um, you know some good books out there. So edible and medicinal plants of the rock of the Rockies, best tasting wild plants of Colorado in the Rockies, and the Rocky Mountain Berry Book. And so you know these are all um, books. They they usually span more than just Colorado. So some of the species mentioned aren't actually in Colorado, um, but it's certainly something to um, look at. And they're kind of fun if you really get into this. Okay, and I. think think. Um, yeah, so that is my last question, or my last slide, so let me um, see what questions. So Jennifer Cook says, um, oops, uh, okay, so do they need to be mulched in the winter? So I'm sorry, Jennifer, I lost the, um, which they, can, you were talking about, so, um, okay, strawberries, thank you. Um, so do strawberries need to be mulched in the winter time? They don't have to be um, mulched, they can be, but they, that's not absolutely a requirement, um, but, you know, mulching them with some straw can certainly help them. But remember, if you, especially if you're dealing with the straight species, those are hardy down to zone one. If you are dealing with a cultivar of a strawberry, um, you know, and you're sort of pushing the, the um, hardiness, then you may want to mulch them in the wintertime. Okay, um, and then John Jessen asks, of the larger plants discussed, what is my best choice for suburban shrub with the neighbors who prefer golf course type lawns? Of the larger plants, I would go with the service berry because it doesn't really sucker as much and it has a more refined look to it and so I think it would go well with your golf course neighbors. Okay, the next question, Donna Hammer says, I want to plant an apple tree at 8,000 foot elevation. Which ones? I unfortunately am not aware of any apple trees that will do well at 8,500 foot elevation. So I'm sorry to, uh, that's part of the reason that I'm interested in the native fruits because I am up in the mountains and it is very difficult to grow any sort of apples or peaches or, you know, pears or any of these other kinds of things. And so um, I like to comfort my comfort myself with the fact that we can um, grow all sorts of really great native fruits. Um, so, yeah, unless you live like in a really special south-facing microclimate and you go for an apple that's, you know, super hardy and super early, um, but, you know, frankly, I don't know of anybody who succeeded in growing an apple tree at 8,500 feet. Okay, so the next question, John Ratcliffe says, can you give us the website for the recipes and the fact sheet again? Yes, I can try to click back to that. And then um, the next question, um, John Jessam says, have you had any luck with blueberries in the higher elevations? So blueberries will often be um, hardy to higher elevations, um, but you do want to test your soil because higher elevations, um, you know, you could have all kinds of different soil pHs and blueberries require a very acidic soil. So they want super acidic soils and we don't usually have that to give them, but um, possibly <laughs> Excuse me, but possibly you, if you do have an acidic soil, you could you know try growing them. You do also probably want to um, mulch them and protect them against the drying winds that we have all winter long. Okay, so let me go back. So the um, so here's the fruits of your labor cookbook, and then uh, um, oops, okay. So and then I'll just switch back. So um. Oh, yeah, so Cheryl, happy spring to everybody tomorrow, yes. Um, and then so Jennifer asks, um, are there good places to purchase native transplants in Colorado or mail order? So there are different um, places. Uh, so if you go to the Colorado Native Plant Society website, they give a lot of retail vendors of native plants. And so that's um, C-O-N-P-S, um, Colorado Native Plant Society dot org and they give retail vendors on their website. And that's where I would recommend trying to get um, places to get a bunch of these native plants. Um, some of them are a little bit harder to get. So like the Canadian um, service berries, you know, the named cultivars, probably those you're gonna have to buy mail order. I've never seen those um, uh, for sale at local nurseries. Although, you know, maybe if we all start asking for them, they'll start carrying them. Okay, and then Jennifer points out to John that there's a webinar on growing blueberries, um, and there's an archived webinar, so that would be a terrific resource. 
And then um, Carolyn says you didn't mention Nanking cherries. Um, they're in the cookbook. And um, yeah, so the Nanking cherries are not native. And so this was a native um, you know, discussion on native plants. They certainly work. They're fine. They're not a noxious weed. So you can certainly um, grow them and use them, but they're not uh, native plants. So that's not why I mentioned that, or that's why I didn't mention them. And so then um, Donna Hammer asks, what was the cultivar name for the best Ribes odoratum? So the um, Crandall clove currant was the one um, that's the Ribes odoratum. Um, but you could also go with the, um, uh, if you wanted to go with Gwen's buffalo berry, I don't think you'd notice a huge difference between the two of them. They're both fragrant, they both produce good fruit, and they both have good fall color. Thank you very much, Walt, for your kind words. Um, so then Dan asked, what about the Bessie sand cherry? Yeah, so the, um, it's, a, it's a good plant. It was, it's not, um, so the, you know, the, um, it's, it's just not as flavorful. And so I know I was talking about some ones that are flavorful, but really that's, um, it's a great landscaping plant and I like it a lot. It's just not one of the ones that would immediately come to mind as something that, you know, you'd be, you know, produce, um, growing fruits for your own consumption. Although wildlife really does like the plants. Um, and then, um, yeah, so Megan points out that the Colorado State Forest Service Nursery sells a lot of these plants as seedlings, and that's a great point, too. So if you do have, um, if you can find a local cooperator, so it's usually your local conservation district, or sometimes it's your Colorado State Forest Service, or sometimes it's your extension office that does have these um, seedling trees. Now, for a lot of people, the seedling tree sale is ended depending on where you live. Um, in Gilpin County, just because we're higher elevation and we have one of the last deliveries in the entire state, our last day to order these trees, um, the trees and shrubs, is April 5th. But I think a lot of places, they've already had their last order for the year, but it's certainly something to consider about consider for future years. So you order it in the wintertime, and then they are available in the, um, in the spring, uh, usually on a specific pickup day sometime in April or May. So... Um, Okay, so are there any other questions otherwise? Um, and thank you all for your kind words. I appreciate that. It's always good, especially when you're, you can't see anybody's reaction. So I do appreciate that. And um, so let me go to the poll. And I think we can still see the... Um, the so I, before people do leave, I do want... It, it would be great if people could... Um, answer their, um, your knowledge of Colorado fruits after this presentation. So, uh, you know, you learned some, you learned a lot, whatever, whatever works. So, um, and you're all very welcome. Um, yeah, so it was a pleasure being here with you all. Um, I'll just see if there's any other questions coming on. But yeah, I think that these are great plants to grow, so I highly recommend them. All right, you're all very welcome. So yeah, so again, this um, you know, this webinar will be recorded and archived, so you know, you can all go back and refer this, refer to it. So anyway, hope you all get out there, get to planting some things, have good luck in in finding um, some of the native plants and finding you know, and plant them, and I think you will thoroughly enjoy having them in your garden.